Hi, my name is Kevin Bass with Fix My Hog. Uh, thanks for being here. Today we're looking at an old 1947 Harley Davidson knucklehead. Um, we're trying to show and get people involved with if you have an old bike, how do you get to learn the bike? Well, how do you know the bike to ride every day? How do you know the bike to wrench on it? And what better way to really get to know your new motorcycle, new old motorcycle in this case, than to tear the bike apart piece by piece, take it down to nothing, and rebuild it back up from scratch. That way you know every nut and bolt, you know things have been torqued correctly, you can find anything that needs to be repaired and fix it. So in this case, on uh, this old knucklehead that I have here, we realized the frame had some uh, major issues that we found. So we're going to put a new frame in it uh, today. So we're going to take it all apart, starting with uh, the top, working our way down. I'm going to explain all the process, how do you do this, um, keeping things organized and knowing what's what and where to put it and how to put it back on. Because everybody can take something apart, but if you don't know how to put it back together correctly, that's going to be a problem. And you don't want to have your bike all back together and a pile of nuts and bolts left over going, uh-oh, where do those go? So what I'm going to do today is go real slow and easy, walk through everything here, and just show you if you have your motorcycle on a lift and you want to tear it down all the way and know, know what's what and have the ins and outs, here's the process. So with any motorcycle, um, obviously, they, are, they have gas and oil in them usually. I mean, if you have an old bike that's been running, they're going to be full of gas. They're going to have oil in the crankcase. You need to get all that out of there to be able to work on it. Otherwise, it's going to get all over the place. In this case here, we already pre-drained our oil. To do that, there's just an oil uh, drain plug down below. We uh, put an a oil pan to catch all that to not let it get in the ground and you know, tamper with that. And we got all the oil out. I put the plug back in. So the oil tank is empty, clean, and dry. Um, our transmission has fluid in it. We don't have to drain that. That's self-encased. There's no lines or hoses where it's going to leak when we pull the transmission out. So we're good there. And then the last piece it would be the gas tank. We do have gas in there. We want to get that out. Um, and we necessarily don't have to drain the whole gas tank in this application because I'm going to take the tank off anyway. So as long as you have a working petcock and you can turn the petcock off, That'll keep the gas in there. I don't have to drain this fully as if I was taking this apart to weld it or fix it. So what I'm going to do is take my gas line off here, have a little gas can to catch the residual that's in the line, get it out. Then I'm going to unbolt my gas tank, take the gas tank off. I'm going to remove the seat, get the seat off, and then we'll look at disconnecting wiring and electrical stuff to get all that off so that we can move on to the bigger steps of you know, engine and transmission and wheel uh, disassembly. So to start this, again, make sure your petcock is turned off. Now everybody's going to have different stuff on their bikes, it depends what you have. If it's a stock style knucklehead gas tank, you'll have a petcock that goes through the gas tank here. Uh, in this case, this is an old peanut tank, kind of a chopper edition. It's got a petcock that's down here, and this one not, is not your traditional style petcock. This is a spigot, almost like a faucet turning your hose on, garden hose on and off. So I just want to make sure that's all the way in and tight so that when I pull this gas line, all my gas doesn't drain out all over the place and make a mess. So I'm going to grab my gas can here. Um, put it up on my lift. All we need to take this off, um, and another thing to remember is depends on what kind of gas lines you have. This one here is just some rubber hosing with uh, some uh, hose clamps. If I had a traditional stock style gas tank on here, we'd actually have solid steel lines. That's how the old Harleys ran them. So this here would go around the back and go into here. We'd have a crossover tube that would connect the left and right hand side together. So you may see different style gas lines, and just make sure you do your research to know what style you have and how it's going to come off. These would just be coming off with a 9 16 uh, In this case, though, we have these aftermarket just rubber lines. All I need to do here, take my screwdriver, loosen up my bottom hose clamp to the carb, pull that hose clamp back carefully, and then put the line in my gas can just to let the gas drain out of the hose. And I can see my fuel filter right there, so I can watch the gas, and you maybe will see it. The gas is starting to drop down. Once that fuel filter is empty, that means my gas line is empty. So now I can take my gas line off, no more gas coming out, put my gas, secure this, put it away safe, away from any flammable areas, and then I can work to the next step, which would be the gas tank itself to remove it. Now they're Bolted to the bikes in various ways, stock style gas tanks, bolt together with uh, all the way through bolts. There's a lower mount there, a rear mount. This one, because it's a custom chopper style tank, there's just an Allen head bolt that goes through here uh, with a lock nut on it, and I can undo that. And then the rear, they drill the hole and put the bolt through the frame, so I'm going to do that. So all I need for this one is a quarter inch Allen wrench, put it in there, 
and then a half inch socket or a wrench because in this case I can't get a socket on this bolt because it's too close to the gas tank so I can just use my Allen wrench here and get this loose and once it's loose enough I should be able to start spinning it freely and it is a lock nut so anytime you use lock nuts remember they do have that plastic uh, locking mechanism on it so you do have to get them quite a ways off before you can finger tight them off because that plastic does cause some friction which is what it's designed to do so that your bolts don't come loose on you when you don't want them to so there we got that one free I can get it all the way out and then this is step one of my disassembly. You want to keep all your parts in check. Don't just have a big bucket of nuts and bolts and throw this stuff in there and forget what went where. That's going to cause problems. You like to take your stuff off, lay it out. If you have a big shop where you can have a bench, start from left to right or wherever you want. But take all your parts off in sequence, lay them out with all the hardware right there. So when you're ready to put this back together, reverse order, everything's in place. You know what you got. You're not scrambling for nuts and bolts and parts and pieces. So I'm going to take this and pull these out right now and just set them on the lift while I'm working on the front one still after this rear one comes out. I'm going to keep them close so I don't forget. Uh, this front one I can actually get a socket on. So I'm going to work on the front mount now. I got my socket. Fits on that bolt. Get it loose. Same thing now. Oh, this is a long bolt. So I'm gonna, for the sake of ease of getting this off, I'm gonna get to the other side where I can work the ratchet because this one just has to hold the bolt. So give me a second here and I'm gonna walk the other side of the bike. Now I can reach on here, grab my Allen head. And this bolt had a lot more extra thread sticking out, so it's going to take a little bit longer. And when I replace this one, I'll probably make note of that and put a little shorter bolt in so there's not so much sticking out. Another thing, if you have a really nice paint job, it's good to take some uh, maybe a cloth or an old dish towel and tape it around your gas tank so you're not bumping into your tank with the wrench and putting any chips. If you hear a that could be a chip tank if you've got expensive paint job, you're going to be going, ooh. In this case, this is a beat up old tank. I'm not so worried about it. But be aware of that. Chips happen, accidents happen. You know, put the time in before you start this assembly to protect things you don't want to get beat up because it does happen. Okay, so now that we got that out, pull my lines. Now I'm going to move back to the other side, take out that bolt, then I can remove the gas tank. Again, now I'll put these in the front, so I know this is my rear set. That's going to be my front set. Pull that out. I'm going to just feed my washers on. Carefully wiggle my tank off. Tank comes off all in one piece. There is a lot of gas in this one, so be careful. You don't lose control and drop it. It does get wishy-washy and splashy. And then, like I said, I'm going to take my nuts and bolts the hardware and I'm just going to put it right back in and loosely snug it on so when I go to put this back on there I don't have to be scrambling one and where all my hardware went for this tank. Just a simple little thing that some people overlook it because you're just in a rush to get your stuff apart but this is a great great way to keep yourself organized. Now I'm going to put this on the bench behind the bike and then I can move on to the next step. Organization is key. The more organized you are, the easier the process will be. Okay, now that we have the gas tank off, this allows us a little more of a visual look at what was under here. And I knew right away, I'm replacing this frame, that's why we're taking this apart. I knew right away I saw this piece of angle iron, which showed me there must have been a crack or some sort of a structural problem with this frame because this bar is gone. Well, now looking at the top, now that the tank's up, I can see that there's another piece that's been welded all the way along the top. So that means this whole top backbone is pretty much junk. It would need to be cut out and replaced with a new one. This is just a band-aid repair. You wouldn't want to leave that forever. Again, 
why I, I didn't know it was that bad. I knew we had some problem, but now I'm glad I took the tank off because this really opened up a can of worms that I wouldn't want to have anybody riding this bike on the road. So we're going to replace that with a new frame. So now we're going to look at our seat. In this case, this seat's got a welded uh, seat hinge mount on the frame. It's an Allen wrench style there, so I'm going to grab my Allen wrenches behind the bike, bring them over, and then I'll see what size we got there. It's probably going to be about... A 530 seconds. And this one is just threads right in so I don't have to have a wrench on the other side. Loosen up our pivot. You know, and while I'm taking things out, some of these nuts and bolts take a little longer to get out. They may need a little, little lube to get them you know, uh, freed up because they get rusty from time. But while I'm working on one piece, wherever my hands are, I like to just visually look at that area within that. So while I'm screwing this out, instead of just kind of being a never never line, I'm actually looking, I'm already visualizing how I'm gonna get that nut off for my top motor mount and how the oil lines are hooked up. And I'm looking at kind of foreshadowing in my head what I wanna do in the next couple steps before I even get to them. That way you have a game plan and you're not doing a lot of whole humming around trying to figure out what to do. So this comes off, same thing, this is threaded. So I'm gonna just put it, you know, it would go through there into the seat. So in this case, I'm gonna put it right back in, thread it in part way so that I don't lose it. Now I know where it is, I got it. I'm gonna put this behind the bike on the table next to the gas tank. And now we get a better visual again of kind of the whole top of the bike. We can see we have some wires coming through the frame that we're gonna to have to get at, so we may have to clip some of these wires. And when we start taking wires apart on this and doing the electrical stuff, we really want to mark everything so we know where it came from and where it goes. So when we put this back together, you're not looking at a pile of wires going, geez, I don't know which one goes where. So give me one minute. I'm going to get some tape and a marker, and we're going to mark some wires before we disassemble. All right, welcome back. Now what we're going to look at, I'm um, taking the wiring apart on this thing, getting everything off that has to do with the wiring, electrical headlight, taillight, and all that and kind of stripping on all that, so that's out of the way. Wiring can be your biggest nightmare, so really make sure you take your time, know what you're doing when you take it apart, know what you're gonna do when you put it back together, and do it correctly. Don't cobble wires together, they're gonna short out, they're gonna cause problems down the road. So in this case, we're gonna start up front here with our headlight. Now this runs internal wiring in the bars to a dimmer switch, high, low, off switch, which is standard on stock bar. Even though these aren't stock Harley handlebars, um, these were drilled for the internal wiring. Well, that means you're gonna have wires that come through your bar somewhere and come out. And you can see there's a sheathing on this wire so that it doesn't rub on where the hole is through the bar and short out on you. So in this case, I'm looking at that. You never wanna to have to pull wires through the bar if you don't have to. It is a pain. It is the hardest part of getting wires done. So what I wanna do is find where my wires come out and where were they connected from coming out of the bars to my other wires to the, the uh, electrical equipment. In this case, I can see there's some heat shrink here and solder joints. So this means there's not a quick way to just unscrew a bolt and disconnect this. I'm gonna have to do some cutting. And the best place to cut a wire is where it's already been cut once and re-soldered together. That way I don't lose any length off my stock wiring the way it was. And it's already been a splicer anyway, so it's gonna be easy to just re-splice it when I wanna go back together. So on here, there's some safety wire that was kind of bundling this stuff together. I wanna to cut that safety wire off so I can get at these wires a little better. Trim that off, pull my wires apart. Now I see this was my ground wire. Ground wire was connected to the frame where the gas tank was. So with anything, as you take it off, just mark it. You know, it's easy enough. It doesn't take you very long. Use some tape and uh, put a little piece of tape on it and just make a mark for yourself. In this case, I'll just write a little ground. So I'll just put this right over it, use my little Sharpie here, and write ground. That way you know that's ground when you take this thing and go to put it back together. Now my other ones, I'm not quite sure which is high, low, or whatnot, so I'm just gonna mark the wires both sides. I'll mark wire one, wire two, and then this wire is going down to my generator, which is power. So I know I need that one to be going to power. And this one comes down and around. I think I'm not going to cut this one yet because I think that one goes to the generator where I can actually take a little nut off and remove that so that this doesn't have to be resoldered later. So now I'm down to only have to cut two wires, 
which isn't bad for the front of the bike. So I'm going to take my tape again and some good painter's tape, you know, just something that'll stick, but you don't want to use like uh, um, Gorilla tape or duct tape, stuff that's going to be hard to get on and off. This stuff is nice because it's easy to put on, easy to take off. It does stick fairly good and it'll allow you to make your, your uh, marks that you need and then take it off when you're done and it won't be in the way. So I'm going to wrap around both sides of this and then I'm just going to cut it right in the center so that I can write on this. And I probably grabbed a little too long a one, but that's all right. I'll take my wire and I'm going to write number one on this side and number one on that side. So now I know I have one and one, and then I can cut right in between those two. And now I know when I go back together, one goes to one. And now being that we're not going to splice any other wires, I really don't have to mark the other one. No sense to, right? Because all I have to worry about is one and one. And then these two that aren't marked at all will go back together. So now I know I have my wires figured out. So when this comes out and I go to put it back together, the non-marked one goes to the non-marked one. Number one goes to number one. This goes to ground. This wire here we know goes down to the generator. It's got a bolt on the a post of the generator. So I'm going to go get this bike turned around, unbolt it from down below, show you how that's connected, and then we'll go from there. All right, now that we have the bike spun around, get a look at this side, we can see that this is a generator. So these old style bikes all run off a generator. The generator creates power to recharge your battery if you have one. In this case, because we're running a magneto, this generator just powers your lights, your headlight, tail light. This has nothing to do with the ignition on this bike because it has a magneto. And it's also, this has been converted to 12 volt system. So this is a 12 volt psychoelectric generator with an end mount regulator. So the regulator is built into the end, so your output comes out of the generator correctly. It doesn't overcharge a battery if you had one or it won't burn out your bulbs. So there's two posts on these generators. You'll always see, okay, there's a B terminal, which is battery, which means your power coming out would go to your battery if you're charging your battery off it. The top one is your, actually your light. So if you have a warning light, if your generator fails, you'd go to that one and then your, your generator light would come on if this isn't functioning properly. Again, for that, you would need a battery system. So you turn your ignition key switch on you would see the battery uh, generator light come on once you start the bike and the generator spinning, that light goes off. With a magneto system like this, no key switch, none of that, I don't have it hooked up because I don't need it. It's not doing me any good. So this is a 5 16 small little uh, bolt on there. It's a brass post uh, bolt. Be careful, don't snap them off. And what all I'm going to do is loosen this up, take the nut off, and then I can pull my wire that goes up to my headlight off. So this is basically just giving me direct power right to my headlight as soon as the bike is running. Because again, no battery, magneto only, 12 volt generator. Just like anything else, put my bolts, nuts and bolts close so I can quickly put them back on. I got my wire off now, I can see that. And this bike has a lot of speed wire going up and around it. So I'm gonna run to the back here, grab my clip, my clippers, and I'm gonna clip all the speed wire, or safety wire as it's called. I call it speed wire because we always put it on any bikes that we race. Get that off of there. And one more down here. This bike must have been really fast with all this speed wire. All right, now that we have that off, I can pull that wire. It was up through. Now this wire for my handlebars is going to stay intact because what this wire is doing now when the bike's running the generator's pumping power all the way up through into my handlebar, goes through the switch. So now it'll tell me if I want high or low using the switch, comes back out of there into the headlight. So this is a self-contained system. This had nothing to do with the back of the bike or any other light. So I'm just gonna take this, I'm gonna wrap it around my handlebars safely, because I'm not gonna be taking these bars apart. And that way it's out of the way and it's just here. So when I put the bike back together, I know what to do to grab that wire and hook it back up to the generator. Okay, so now that we have the, all the lights done, I can pull my wires here. They were fed through the front end. And I will be careful not to lose my tape or markings. Which I just did, so I wanna make sure I stick that back on there. And my last one come through. 
And I think at this point, I'm going to leave these right here because when I rebuild this bike with a new frame, I'm going to still run this headlight. I'm not going to change the headlight. So there's no reason pulling all the wires, you know, getting things off because I'm going to have this still on there when I put it back on. And to make it easier on myself, just leave the wires. That way they're tucked up nice out of the way. You just don't want the wires dangling where they could get in the way when you're trying to take the front end off. So now we're done with the front of the bike with the headlight. Now we're going to spin the bike again and we're going to take off the... Uh, tail light and before we spin it this tail light was connected the same way to the generator so now I can while I have that wire off still grab my generator wire get it off of there and it's a little bit beat up So this is the wire now that feeds all the way back to my tail light to give my tail light power. So this actually goes to the brake switch. From the brake switch, you have two posts coming off. One goes to the tail light that's running all the time. The other one from the brake switch, when you hit the brake pedal, it actuates your stop brake light. So this is the same thing where I'm just pulling it off. I'm going to feed the wire back through. So I'm going to turn the bike around again now so we can get a look at the other side and finish up this assembly. All right, now that we have the tail light power wire off. Now we need to feed it back through the frame or wherever it may be. In this case it runs behind the carburetor support mount and this is going to go down to our mechanical brake switch. So our power, like I said earlier, goes to the brake switch. From the brake switch it goes to your tail light for an always on and then the brake light so when you hit the brake it actuates the brake. So we're going to take this and loosen it up and this one here has got quite a bit of grease and grime on it. So I'm going to have to dig in a little bit, but we should be able to get that off. It's just a couple of little bolts that hold on. There we go, a little screw there. So you can see now the screw, it's, even though it's all greased up, but that screw holds it on to the top post of this brake switch. Then there's another wire at the bottom of the brake switch that runs back to the tail light. So this one here... I'm going to disconnect these two apart from each other. So this is my power from the brake switch to the generator. So again, mark everything. I'm going to put a little piece of tape on that. Just make a note to myself. Power. brake and generator. So now I know this is power to my brake and generator. I can put this aside. Again, lay everything out in order as I take it off so I keep it organized. Now, feed that wire through. And now we'll take the bottom connector off the switch. Just small little screws. Again, sometimes they get a little gum gunked up from time and grease and usage. Just gonna make sure I can get at it. I don't wanna strip anything out. Always be careful when you're disconnecting things so you don't strip anything. If you strip out these little threads, then it's going to be pretty much useless and you have to get a new switch. So now I have my brake light and tail light power wires here. They feed through my battery box. I'm going to pull them up and then they come up underneath. They ran my frame rail, I see, and then came through the old sidecar loop mount there. So again, I'll take my snips, which is over here, and I'm going to snip off all the safety speed wire without cutting my actual wires themselves, which is a no-no. The less areas of connection where you have to re-solder or reconnect wires, the better. You want to try to have a good, solid, single line running through. This one's got a little zip tie holding that together. And again, with old bikes, be ready to get dirty. You can see I got grease all over me. Don't be afraid of a little grease, just have some good wipes ready to go. 
But with these old bikes, with time, with using them, if you're tearing one apart that's been ridden for years, you're going to get dirty. Dress appropriately, be ready to get a little dirty. Now pulling my wires, I can wrap them around the tail light. And then my last step here is going to be to disconnect my tail light bracket and license plate bracket from the frame. And in this case, they're just bungs that are threaded, so nothing's been welded to the frame, which is great. Nothing worse than seeing uh, an old frame have things welded on. It shouldn't be there. So now I'm going to go to my tool chest behind the bike. I'm going to grab a half inch wrench, which looks like it's a half inch, and I'm going to loosen those bolts. I'll be able to remove my tail light. And then all of our wiring is disconnected on this. Because this is a magneto system, it's very simplified. These, these wires off the magneto are only plug wires. They go right to the plugs. When you turn this over, this creates spark, it fires. I don't have to have any other wires to that magneto, nothing. And being that there's no battery, no switches, no other relays. All I have is a headlight, high, low, tail light, brake light, and that's it. So this is pretty simple disassembly. So I'm going to grab my half inch. short one tidy righty lefty loosey always Again, these are some long bolts in these. Usually you, you don't need such a long, long bolt. A little overkill, but that was a short one. So the top one was a short one. That's probably the right size, all you need, as long as you got a good half inch thread holding. This bottom one, for whatever reason, they must have ran out of short ones, is about an inch too long. So it goes in there a country mile. So you can see the difference. Don't need that much way overkill so I'll probably replace that when I do put it back together but as always thread your bolts back in to where they came from so you don't forget where they came from and what's great again about these original frames nothing was cut chopped welded on this to make this license plate work it's just a couple threaded bungs welded to the back of the plate they bolted right into the stock mounts easy on easy off great little chopper modification great way to not wreck history because even though you build a chopper or bobber now you may want to go back to stock 10 12 15 years from now whatever it may be and there's nothing worse than having a frame that's been cut up chopped up welded on then it's, it's a whole lot more work so with that off i'm going to put that in my lineup here the electrical and as you can see from that point right now we got everything disconnected electrical wise and this thing's ready to go to the next step all right, now we're going to remove the oil lines from the bike in preparation for uh, get oil tank removal. The oil lines here, you can see we have a couple fittings. We have our breather, we have our return, and we have our feed line. All these lines just thread in. Um, as you can see here, this is a stock steel oil line. What it would look like, the kind of threads it has in the fitting style. And on this bike, there's actually been some modification with some rubber hose in some different areas. Um, a lot of times in the old days, if a hose gets kinked or broken, they would just cut it off, splice in some rubber hosing. So when we rebuild this bike, we'll probably replace some of these lines with the nice new stock ones that don't have any breaks or kinks or repairs done to them. To take these off, I'm just using a crescent wrench at this time, and it's just a fitting that loosens up. Once you remove an oil line, real important, once the oil line's off, consider this system compromised, which means don't trust that it's going to be clean when you put it back on. The worst thing for your engine and your motorcycle and any vehicle is grit, grime, grease, dirt, rocks, you name it. Any garbage gets in this oil line, it's going to get pumped into your bike system and it's going to wreck your bike. It's going to go through and it's going to tear up the internals of your bike and, and, and make it um, need to be a full repair. So when I take stuff off, 
I always tell myself, make sure I know now I need to parts wash this, clean it real good, make sure I blow it out with clean compressed air, and make sure that the lines are 100% clean, debris free, dirt free, and ready to go back on. So keep that in mind, just uh, be ready to do some cleanup on this stuff after they're off. Line comes off, and this one because it's got that rubber hose, I can kind of pull it down out of the way. The same is going to go tr hold true for my oil tank itself, too. Now that we have some compromised lines here, you can see there's actually some thread sealant on there that could get in your oil tank. That could cause problems. You got to clean your oil tank out real good. Get all that stuff off of there before you would ever reuse or reassemble this. So keep that in mind. Always put yourself in that position that you're going to do things correctly. Sometimes the correct way takes a little bit longer, but in the long run, it's the right way to do it. So you don't have to worry about damaging equipment and costing you thousands of dollars down the road for unneeded repairs. And. Both oil lines off. Now I'll be able to remove my oil tank, fender, and some other key components. We'll get after that in a minute. 